Mathematics as a whole is a pretty broad discipline. The fields of math each have their own theoretic abstraction, and many of the ideas derived from these theories have unexpected applications to the real world. And I've talked about some of those instances in the past couple of videos, but today I want to talk about a field that in some sense unifies the fields of mathematics and formalizes mathematics structure, category theory. If you took some time to think about what any given mathematician does in a general sense, you'd probably say that a mathematician studies mathematical objects and the transformations between these objects. In order to make these vague terms of mathematical object and transformation seem more tangible, let's give a few examples. Some algebraists study mathematical objects called groups, and functions that preserve the fundamental properties of groups, like group homomorphisms. On the other hand, some dynamicists work with one-dimensional shift spaces, and sliding block codes are a type of transformation between these objects. Both of these groupings of objects and transformations are examples of a category. A category is a collection of objects and a collection of morphisms, or arrows, where each morphism has a domain object and a codomain object. Each object has an identity morphism. If we have two morphisms, f and g, where f goes from x to y and g goes from y to z, then the composition gf from x to z is also a morphism. And if we have a third morphism, h from z to w, the composition h with the composition g of f and the composition of h of g composed with f are equal. Like many, if not all, mathematical objects, we can learn more about a category by looking at a transformation from it to another category. These transformations are called functors. A functor f from a category c to a category d contains the following information. One, an object big F c in d for each object c in big C. And two, a morphism big F little f for each morphism little f that respects its domain and codomain. Next, there are two functorality axioms. First, for any composable pair fg and big C, big FG and big FF, are composable and respect the composition in big C. Second, for each object in big C, the identity morphism 1C is respected by the functor. So that was a lot, and categories are really hard to visualize, but thankfully there are certain types of categories that are really small and you can write them all down on a piece of paper, and those are directed graphs. So for example, if we go ahead and let C be this directed graph where the objects are vertices and the morphisms are the directed arrows between them, one such functor that operates on C results in the following directed graph. It'd probably be a good idea to check the functorality axioms here before moving on just so you are comfortable with what is going on. So we have categories and we have functors and you're probably at the point of why do we care? Um, so categories can be used to study a plethora of different areas, including biology, linguistics, neuroscience, networks, and different optimization problems. In computer science specifically, there are many direct applications because there is the programming language Haskell. Um, Haskell is a programming language that operates in the category that is named Hask. And so Hask is the category with types or data types as objects and functions of these data types as morphisms. Haskell has a type class called functor, which is used to define functors from Hask to subcategories of Hask, which instead of having any type as objects, only have types specified by the functor as objects. So for instance, you could like move from Hask to the category of list types or or num types or different types of data types anyway so that is haskell and like a small little drop of uh <laughs> of introduction you we could spend days on haskell but moving on to a more mathematical kind of deal because math category theory and functors arise all over the place one of the more famous functors in mathematics is that which derives the fundamental group of a topological space from a topological space and a base point so if you don't know what those things are, I've done some videos that are related to those topics that are up over here. So if you want to check those out before moving on, that would 
probably be best. They're also linked in the description below. But anyway, moving on. So this functor, uh, pi sub one, is sending objects from top star, which is the category of topological spaces with fixed base points as objects, and base point preserving continuous maps as morphisms to the category group, aka GRP, which has groups as objects, and group homomorphisms as morphisms, which we mentioned earlier are functions that preserve group structure. So this functor is really cool because it completely categorizes closed surfaces and that would take a while to prove, but we're not gonna talk about that here. Uh, I just wanna talk about one place where this functor comes up and that is in the proof of the Borsuk-Ulam theorem, which is again up in the cards over here. So an example of this functor in action lies at the center of the proof of the Borsuk-Ulam theorem. And it happens when we compare the sphere to the circle in one of the preliminary steps that makes the Borsuk-Ulam theorem go pretty quickly when you've built up all the information that you need. Anyway, the idea in the middle of the proof of the Borsuk-Ulam theorem is that you need to figure out what loops are doing on a sphere and what loops are doing on a circle. So on a sphere, a loop is uh, with a given base point can always be shrunk down to the base point using a continuous base preserving map. So all the loops on the sphere are topologically equivalent. Even if you take two of these loops that have the same base point and stitch them together at the base point, you can still take that new loop that you have and just shrink it down to a point. Thus, when you're connecting loops to each other, you just get a loop that is topologically the same as the two you added together. This observation gives the fundamental group of the sphere as the trivial group, which is the one only with the element zero and with the group operation of addition. On the other hand, when we're looking at the circle, things aren't so simple. So the idea is that we would also want to be able to shrink loops down on the circle, but that's not always possible because if the loop goes all the way around the circle, then there's no way to shrink that loop down into a point because the only space that you have to continuously morph the loop is on the circle. Uh, whereas on the sphere, we had all of this surface area that we could use to morph things continuously. So if you add a loop to itself that goes around the circle once, the new loop that you've stitched together at that base point goes around the circle twice. This observation of having loops that go around an integer number of times gives the fundamental group of the circle as the integers with addition. So categorically, one can represent this information about the sphere and the circle in the following diagram using the functor pi sub one. The proof of the Borsuk-Ulam theorem follows from the fact that there is no additional morphism in this diagram that is also antipode preserving. That is, any antipode preserving map is not continuous. If it were, there would be a non-trivial morphism from the trivial group to the group of the integers with addition, which just doesn't happen. So that's one of the many places where category theory comes up as a useful tool to commute mathematical information into other mathematical information so that you can work with it more easily. But that is kind of all I wanted to talk about today. Hopefully that gave you a brief introduction or a taste of what category theory is or what people that study category theory study. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics videos. If you'd like to hear me talk about any particular math topic, you can also leave those in the comments down below. Anyway, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.